In the mid to late 90s, South Africa experienced a spike in the number of serial killers targeting mainly women. This includes the likes of Moses Sitole, the ABC killer, Sipo Twala, the Phoenix Strangler, Christoph Amplengwa Zigote, the Donnybrook killer, and today's topic of discussion, Lazarus Tidiso Mazingani. He's also known as the Nazareth Taxi Killer. This leaves a bitter taste in one's mouth as this time was supposed to be a hopeful time for South Africans. The apartheid government had been dismantled and people could now move freely within the country looking for opportunities to better their lives. Instead, it was stained by a dark cloud of terror and mistrust and it left hundreds of women violated and lives lost in the hands of a few depraved individuals. Welcome back to the True Crime Corner with Mama Venus. I am back to delivering your weekly dose of South African true crime. If you are coming across my videos for the first time, then it's just welcome. Please take a second to like this video and click on the subscribe button just to support the channel and to easily access my videos. Just like many of the cases that I have covered on this channel, the case we are covering today saw me going through a series of emotions. This was mostly because of how the person we are going to be talking about has shown little to no genuine accountability for his actions over the years. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's start from the beginning. Lazarus T.D. Mazingane is said to have been born in 1973. I couldn't find any reliable sources for his exact birth date and month, a common occurrence in this type of stories. Interestingly enough, he was born in prison of which is quite an irony given that he will most likely die in prison. His mother, Mercy Mazingane, had been serving a five-year prison sentence at the time. It is alleged that she was sentenced for dealing marijuana, even though she denies it until today. Lazarus is said to have not known his father, but according to Mercy, the men lived in a neighboring township called Orlando. This is less than five kilometers from Deep Kloof, where the Mazingane family lived. Soon after Messi gave birth to Lazarus, she sent him home to be raised by her mother, his maternal grandmother. He would spend the early years of his life believing that his grandmother was his birth mother until Messi returned from prison. Growing up, Lazarus lived with his grandmother, his siblings, and cousins. His uncle was also present in his life, and he was of great help in raising the young man and his siblings. And he was the only male role model that the Mazingane family had at the time. Now, as mentioned in my previous videos, the 70s was a rough time to be born or to be growing up in South Africa. Black people, especially those living in townships and rural areas, were viewed as bottom of the barrel, and they had very limited opportunities to advance themselves and to improve their quality of life in society. So it's no surprise that the Mazingane family was one of the many families that were drowning in poverty and destitution. They lived in a small shack and the family didn't have any source of income. According to Lazarus, his grandmother would sometimes dig through rubbish bins around the neighborhood for something to cook. Despite his grandmother's best efforts to raise them the best way she knew how, Lazarus says that he felt very neglected by her when he was growing up. Things worsened when his mother returned from prison to live with them, as she was also neglectful and very abusive to her children. Any punishment is said to have resulted to being beaten to a pulp. According to Lazarus, the situation was worse for him because he wet the bed at night so he would get beatings on a regular basis. All this abuse and neglect from both his mother and grandmother made him feel rejected and he formed some sort of hatred towards women. This is understandable because those were the two people who were meant to love and protect him, but they consistently beat him down both in words and with the rod. Growing up, his family and neighbors described Lazarus as a quiet person who was calm and would never show his anger to people. According to them, it was of great shock to later find out that he had been the one to commit all these heinous crimes. A family friend describes Lazarus as Umahambaedwa, meaning the one who is always alone. And this loner status made it very difficult for him to form friendships at school and around the neighborhood. Eventually, though, he would manage to form a very tight friendship with another boy that he had met at school, and this boy's name was Keza. Keza is said to have been a very bad influence to Lazarus, in a sense that he hung around people who drank, smoked, and did drugs. Lazarus never smoked, drank, or do any drugs in his life, 
and his reasoning is that he had never witnessed his mom, his grandmother, or his uncle be involved in that type of behavior. According to Macy, Lazarus's mom, she really didn't like his friendship with Keza. She described Keza as a naughty child and blames him for introducing Lazarus to the life of crime. Now, this is normal behavior for a parent to want to believe so bad that their child is a saint or at least not capable of such heinous crimes, especially because Lazarus portrayed himself as a quiet and calm person who wouldn't hurt a fly to his family. Lazarus Mazingane's initial criminal acts were in his early teens. This time, he was robbing people and stealing cars alongside his close friend, Keza. In the early 90s, he managed to find employment in a courtyard in Deep Kloof, working for a man by the name of Cindy Nobele and his wife, Busisiwe Chabalala. This couple treated Lazarus as their own son, and they later gave him shelter on a plot of land that they owned in Orange Farm. Orange Farm is located 40 kilometers from his home in Deep Kloof. While he had an orange farm, it isn't clear what had happened to his courtyard job because he said that life was very difficult for him. He was still dirt poor and found it very difficult to secure another job. He would take an easy way out of course and started robbing people and stealing cars as he did back home in Deep Kloof. Shortly after arriving in Orange Farm, he met a woman by the name of Elizabeth and they fell in love. This relationship though, was nothing short of violent and toxic, with Lazarus beating Elizabeth to a pulp every chance he got. One incident took place while Elizabeth was pregnant with what Lazarus thought was his child. According to Lazarus, this altercation started on a Sunday when he couldn't find Elizabeth. When he eventually found her, she had love bites all over her. And when he asked her about the love bites, she apparently told him that it was none of his business. This infuriated Lazarus to a point that he couldn't control his anger. He then grabbed Elizabeth and beat her to a point where he thought she was dead. She was then taken to hospital and fortunately she survived. It isn't clear though if the child did survive or not. This was both devastating and infuriating for Elizabeth's family, I mean rightfully so, so her mom went to confront Lazarus about it. I assume she wanted to find out what was going on, but also to give Lazarus a piece of her mind. Now, according to Lazarus, Elizabeth's mother started swearing at him saying, you are a totally from Soweto, you can't make a child, you don't have a child. She then proceeded to tell him that the child Elizabeth was carrying was not his, and the reason he couldn't find Elizabeth earlier was because she had gone to visit the real father of the child. This revelation escalated Lazarus' anger and he pulled out his gun. He then started shooting at his mother-in-law. He emptied an estimated nine bullets on her, almost killing her immediately. It appears that Lazarus was arrested and tried for this crime, even though it's not clear if he was ever sentenced or served any jail time for it. It was also during this time that Lazarus would be arguably accused of committing his first murder. I say arguably because it isn't really clear if he is the one who committed the murder or he was just an accomplice. So what allegedly happened is that on the 13th of April 1993, the house of Sydney Nobele and Busisiwe Chabalala was burnt down with Busisiwe in it. Busisiwe and Sydney are the couple that had taken Lazarus in and gave him shelter in Orange Farm. Now, there are conflicting testimonies as to who had murdered Busisiwe. According to Sydney, her husband, Lazarus had hit Busisiwe over the head with an iron bar. Thinking that she was dead, he then doused her in paraffin and left Busisiwe next to a burning heater. The paraffin caught fire and set the whole house on fire, leading to Busisiwe suffering fatal burns. According to the summary of facts presented during the trial though, of which I also believe was according to Lazarus, it was both Sydney and Lazarus who had murdered Busisiwe. It is alleged that Lazarus witnessed Sydney and Busisi were arguing at their home in Palm Springs, Cebu Gang. During the argument, it is also alleged that Sydney hit his wife over the head with an iron bar. Out of loyalty to his employer and the only father figure he had ever had in his life, Lazarus helped Sydney douse his wife with paraffin and they placed her near a burning heater. I'm not sure which one to believe though, but I am sure leaning towards to both of them being involved, 
especially because Sidney himself was a very shady character and he admitted in court that he had been having an affair at the time and things were so serious between him and his mistress that they got married soon after his wife was murdered. To me, that is very suspicious. The murder of Busisiwe is believed to have been the crime that launched the young Lazarus into being a murderer. Even though he had shot and almost murdered his mother-in-law earlier, this was the first time that he had allegedly committed a crime that leads to a person losing their lives. He would continue with his petty crimes here and there until two years later when he began a reign of terror that lasted between 1995 to 1998. By the year 1995, Lazarus had been able to secure a driver's license and he was now working as a minibus taxi driver in Johannesburg. It looks like he most drove local routes that are within the Johannesburg area. I tried to figure out which route he drove but couldn't really find anything reliable. Lazarus Mazingane used his job as a taxi driver to stalk and prey on women. It is this job that enabled him to find most if not all of his victims. According to him, he chose women who were loud and shouted at him to hurry up or drive faster because they are late for work or wherever they were going. This would either take place at the taxi rank while he's filling up or during the taxi ride. He says that these women are the ones who triggered and reminded him of his childhood traumas when his mother or his grandmother were shouting reprimanding him. It triggered a kind of anger and frustration that could only be calmed through him committing violent acts towards that specific woman. So basically, instead of addressing whatever anger issues that he had towards female role models in his life or just quitting the job that triggered his violent urges, he saw it fit to violate and kill innocent women on the streets. Now, let's talk about the murders. On the 6th of March 1995, Dineo Margaret Molo disappeared without a trace. Her body would be discovered in a fort located between Nazrek and Arodom Road. She had been raped and strangled with her own belt. She was only 24 years old. A day after Dineo went missing, on the 7th of March 1995, a body of an unidentified woman was found at the intersection of Nazrek and Sports Road. She had also been raped and strangled. On the 10th of March 1996, 32-year-old Lindelani Polina Masang went missing. Her lifeless body was found on the intersection of Aka and Brandy Bush streets in Omonde. She had been robbed, raped, and strangled with a plastic bag over her head. On the 1st of May 1996, 19-year-old Gedibone Catherine Mayebe's lifeless body was discovered near the intersection of Spencer and Main Reef Roads in Rudeport. On the same day, the lifeless body of Gladys Mabaso was discovered in a felt in Naturena. She had been raped and strangled. A day later, on the 2nd of May 1996, the body of Queen Mguni was found near New Canada Road in Soweto. She had been robbed, raped, and strangled to death. At this point, six bodies of women who had been raped and strangled had been discovered. And judging by the MO of these murders, the police had started putting two and two together and came to a conclusion that a serial killer was on the loose. All these women had been brutally raped and strangled to death with their own pieces of clothing. The killer would make a double loop around their neck and a knot right at the center of the victim's neck. This was later called the Mazingane knot. This public outcry put a lot of pressure on the police to find the person who was committing these heinous crimes. The police decided to call in Pete Bailerfeld of the Brixton Murder and Robbery Squad. Pete had experience in solving high-profile crimes and he was a meticulous investigator with good instincts. So having him as one of the investigators in these murders almost guaranteed that the perpetrator would be caught. However, this would not deter Lazarus from his murderous escapade. As the investigation was heating up, Lazarus continued with his reign of terror. On the 6th of May 1996, the lifeless body of Glenn Rose Villagazi was discovered in a fault in the Nazrek Aratin area. She had also been robbed, raped, and strangled. Less than two weeks later, the body of Mainam Simanga was discovered near a road intersection with Pedmbata on the outskirts of Offerton. She had met the same fate as that of Glen Rose. A month later, on the 6th of June 1996, the lifeless body of Prudence Momane was discovered alongside the N1 highway 
on the Nazareth area. She had also been brutally raped and murdered. In July 1996, Maria Chabalala would meet the same fate as that of the other women. Her lifeless body was discovered near the corner of a rifle range road and the Golden Highway. In November the same year, the lifeless body of Utrang Dora had been discovered along the M2 West near the Crown Mines. On the 27th of February 1998, Palesa Molapisi's lifeless body was discovered in Midolens Extension 4. She had also been robbed, raped, and strangled. About two months later, on the 23rd of April 1998, Susan Mlaba's body was also discovered near the Mzimshopes Women's Hostel in Soweto. She had met the same fate as that of Palesa. At this point, the investigators were sure that this was the same person. Not only did the killer have the same MO, the DNA evidence in the form of semen had been collected from all the victims and it was from the same perpetrator. While the bodies of women were being discovered in all corners of Johannesburg townships, in what seemed like completely unrelated events, a hijacker, sometimes two, emerged along the N4 and the N12. Those hijackers had the same MO. They would place rocks on the road, ensuring that any car that passes will either have to drive over the rocks or pull over to remove them so they don't damage the car. Either way, the driver would have to pull over because driving over the rocks will most likely cause damage on your car. One Sunday afternoon in June 1996, a young married couple was driving home with their baby from a mini family getaway in the Hartley's Dam. They unfortunately encountered those rocks and accidentally drove over them, of which caused them to pull over under the bridge a few meters away. As the husband was checking the car trying to assess the damage, a young man came out of nowhere and offered to assist. He pulled out a weapon. Now, I am not sure what type of weapon this was, but it was dangerous enough for the husband to comply. He then made the couple both sit at the front passenger seat with the wife sitting on her husband's lap. Whilst all of this was going on, the poor child could sense something was wrong and was crying hysterically at the back seat. This hijacker was obviously not fazed by the child crying, so he drove the car to a felt where he forced the couple out of the car. He then proceeded to sexually assault the wife whilst the husband was watching. Once he was done, he decided he was going to let them go, but threatened them that if they ever went to the police with this, he would find them and kill them. He took the baby out of the car, gave him to his parents, and drove off leaving the family there. This young couple would not let the threats deter them from reporting this tragic experience to the police. When the wife was examined, the DNA in a form of semen was discovered, and this would later match that of the Nazareth killer. On the 24th of July 1997, another unsuspecting couple would unfortunately be a victim of these hijackings. 66-year-old Gert and his 62-year-old wife Elsie were traveling along the M12 when their tire got punctured as a result of driving over the rocks. Gert had pulled over to change the tire when two young men approached him and they offered to help. He politely refused the help. Then the young man proceeded and ordered him to hand over his car keys. He ignored the order and tried getting back into his car. As he was doing this, he was shot several times and his body was left on the side of the road. The two young men drove off with Elsie. Now, I'm not sure if they had been away at this point, but Elsie was disabled and not able to walk on her own. This didn't stop them though from leaving her in a maze field near Akenov. Fortunately, the pet had not sexually assaulted or killed Elsie and she was discovered the next day at noon by a person who was driving a tractor on the farm. The hijacking crimes and the serial murders would continue for years whilst the police were investigating. During the investigation, Pete had figured that there might be survivors of these attacks and finding them might help break the case open. So he called all the police stations around Johannesburg trying to find out if there were any women with similar experiences who had reported to the police. He was fortunately able to find six women who had a similar story to tell. All those women were very well-mannered and very well-kept women who wore dresses and wore bright-colored nail polish. The dresses and nail polish part made an impression on the investigators because, except for one, all of the dead victims wore dresses and bright-colored nail polish. 
The survivors would all tell Pete of a short, soft-spoken sort of guy who was in his early 20s and worked as a taxi driver. He drove the same route, so the women were used to taking his taxi on a daily basis. This is how he would earn their trust over a couple of months. Once the trust was earned, it would just be one day when the woman finds herself alone with him in the taxi. He would then drive into a secluded area where he would attack and sexually assault them. Now, the investigators knew that they were looking for a taxi driver. It would only be the year 2000 that the investigators would make a huge break in the case. This unfortunately came through Lazarus committing another crime though. A wife of an attorney had been driving on the highway when she accidentally drove over some rocks and punctured her tire. She decided to call her friend to tell her what's going on and whilst on the phone with a friend, a man came out of nowhere, attacked and sexually assaulted her. For whatever reason, he fortunately let her go after the assault and she immediately went to report the crime to the police. Soon after the reports, the perpetrator was found and arrested. And this would be none other than Lazarus Tidiso Mazingani. He was then tried and sentenced to 35 years in prison for hijacking and sexually assaulting the attorney's wife. As this was taking place, Pete and the team of investigators for the Nazarek murders and the hijackings were not aware and would not find out about this arrest and sentencing until months later. Once they found out, Pete realized that the MO was very similar to the unsolved hijackings. So he decided to test Lazarus's DNA against the DNA that they had collected from the victims. And this was an exact match. Finally, the serial killer was no longer on the loose. It was of great relief to Pete and the team that this man was already in prison because they figured it might be easier for him to confess as he had nothing to lose already. Pete transferred him to the Brixton Murder and Robbery Squad Unit Prison where the worst criminals were being kept at the time. After a while, he interviewed him, asking him about all the crimes, and at first, Lazarus denied everything. But Pete continued to gently press him, and he later confessed to the rape, but not the murders. I'm not sure if this happened before or after the trial, but Lazarus eventually confessed to all the crimes and told Pete all the details of his crimes. Some of the details of the murders would change later though, depending on who Lazarus was talking to. For example, when I watched the documentary about his life on Magellan TV called Black Heart Series, he says that he murdered women because they were loud and reminded him of his mother's abuse. But to Pete Bailefield, he said that he targeted women who were very well mannered and very well kept. So, let's not make sure. Lazarus T.D. Mazingane's trial began in April 2002. He faced 75 charges, including that of 17 murders, attempted murder, rape, robbery, assault, and possession of an illegal firearm. He pleaded not guilty to all the charges at the beginning. The trial took place over a period of nine months, and 27 witnesses testified, and there were more than 30 boxes of files and documents for the 75 charges. After a four-day judgment, Lazarus was found guilty of the 74 out of the 75 charges. On the 2nd of December 2002, Lazarus was sentenced to 17 life terms and over 700 years in prison. Okay, side note, remember Lazarus's friend, high school friend that we spoke about earlier, the one that Lazarus's mother did not like? It turns out he would sometimes take along with Lazarus during the hijackings. However, he says that he would not partake in the sexual assault because he was very sick with AIDS at the time. He claimed that anything that he did, his involvement in any of the crimes, he was forced by Lazarus and he was just very afraid of him. He, however, was also tried and sentenced for his part in the hijackings. So, thank God. Um, okay, fam, this is where we ended with this video, even though I still have so much to say. I need to structure those videos um, differently so that I am able to say all the stuff that I want, really, because, wow. Um, if you have made it this far, thank you so much for holding on. This was truly a horrific one, and I pray that the victims' families do find healing someday. 
yeah okay guys if you haven't subscribed as yet please go ahead click the subscribe button also please um like this video as it helps with the youtube algorithm bye guys see you on the next one